Hi everybody, Jeff here. To celebrate the release of the Viscera Fest Chapter 2 soundtrack, I sat down to chat with the composer for Chapter 1, professional musician, longtime Quake modder, and audio man at 3D Realms, Michael Markey. Check out the links in the video description if you want to listen to his music, and with that out of the way, let's jump over to Discord. Hey Margie, it's great to have you on a call for once. We haven't really talked in person, uh, well not face to face, but uh, a little bit over Discord chat. How's it going? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good, Jeff. Uh, just, you know, keeping busy recently. I've been uh, doing a lot of 3D Realm stuff. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, that's been primarily keeping my attention at the moment. Uh, you're not allowed to talk about any of the stuff that you're, you're working on right now, right? I guess of the things that I am working on, uh, Tempest Rising got announced. So there was a trailer for that. They actually released one of my tracks uh, for the song. Uh, and that was also, that track was also in the trailer. Yeah, yeah. So you can check it out. It's called Death Squad. If you go on YouTube and type in Tempest Rising Death Squad, you can hear it. And um, as far as developments from that game, I can't talk about that quite yet, as well as me working on several other, other NDA projects that I can't quite talk about just yeah. yet. Um, I want to show you a track that I did for a Diabotical, which okay. is an arena FPS game. Uh, yeah, send it over. Let's see what we got. This actually comes through the recording. Oh. So everybody can hear this. That's really funny. This is sick, dude. There's so much slap. Yes. That's fun. I like that a lot. That was a nightmare to, to record. I can imagine. <laughs> Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the fact that you did all of Chapter 1's music and the first track off of Chapter 2. It had been a couple of years since I think everything started. I think that what I saw was like 2018 was when some of that stuff got posted. What was the state of the game like back then? What were you seeing in the landscape that sort of influenced you to, to start making the decisions you made? So back then, the game, obviously, the, the scope was a lot more narrow. There were no cutscenes. There was no like serious dynamic music. We wanted to do dynamic music music for maybe just for stuff as simple as you walk into the boss arena, the boss fight starts, the boss music starts playing. That was how far the dynamic music went. And that's as simple as changing MP3s, right? right? Yeah, you yeah. just tell you just tell the engine to play one MP3 over another one. But Osric was doing all the sounds himself too. Mm. Uh, and that's actually one reason why I, I kind of asked like, hey, can I like also do the sounds? Because gotcha. I was making the music and then I, the sounds weren't fitting with the music. Right. And I was like, I want to make them fit. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. so, like, it was bothering me. Like, it was bothering me that, that the, the music I was making wasn't fitting with the audio. Yeah, I, I feel that. At the start of the project, it was just sort of like, like any other classic FPS game where it's just one looping track per level. You know, one of my big design pillars for the Visser Fest soundtrack, at least for chapter one, was that every song needed to have strong singable moments. Mm. I would end up actually constructing a lot of the songs, just figuring out a, uh, a chord progression for the chorus and then a melody. So I would almost like write a chord progression of just like a simple chord progression. And then I would write a melody on top of that. And then I'd go back and I would change the chord progression maybe to something else now that I had written the melody. And then maybe I'll tweak the melody. And then, and then now I sort of had this like skeleton of a song idea and then I would sort of flesh everything out from in that direction. So yeah, it's almost like I start at the top and then everything else comes out on, you know, from beneath that. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I noticed like a lot of, um, you had some very strong melodies and there was a lot of like songy songs as opposed to say, you hear a lot of soundtrack music that's mostly uh, loops or, or rhythms or things that make sense in the atmosphere and in the context, but you made songs that deliberately had strong, like top line synths, you know, a lot of dancey type stuff. Gets away from a lot of the, the heavy quake things that you had been doing. I, I think you actually wrote somewhere, you wanted this like dance metal hybrid type sound. Yeah. Uh, which I guess kind of makes sense if you look at the, the color palette and the aesthetic of the game. Yeah, yeah. I, I know that like if you watch a video of the game being played with the audio muted, it's just like a barrage of colors and speed and all this stuff and it's like well you you have to sort of make the soundscape gel with that and it, it wouldn't feel right if it was just sort of super ambient loops and simple percussion and stuff like that like the game is super in your face so the soundtrack should be super in your face exactly yeah and yeah you did a fantastic job it, it was really like trying to pick it up in 
in chapter two. And by the way, having you do the first song was a blessing because yeah. uh, you had essentially set the tone of the soundtrack, right, mm. um, for, for chapter two. And what that meant is I didn't have to do any exploratory stuff so much as I had to kind of go, what does it mean to extend from this, right? Yes. What does it mean to take from the first part of the soundtrack to understand what you were going for uh, and now be like, how do I think like Marky on this? He made a jump to a new style that still sort of fits, but it's, you know, it's got a new kind of palette. And if I were him, what would I be doing? If it was the next three songs, like what, what would I do, right? I remember Osric and I, Noah, and I um, uh, spent a lot of time on the second level, basically just trying to copy you as hard as possible. And there <laughs> were so many moments when I sent him something and he goes, eh, it's almost there. Sort of sounds like him. It's close. And I was like, God, I've done like four of these. Like, how much closer do we need to get? And that, at that point, I actually reached out to you and I was like, Hey, send me your guitar tone. Send me your bass. I'm gonna straight up copy it. And so I did. I did like an EQ match and I sent it. And he goes, Perfect. I'm like, All right, cool. <laughs> so you want literally a clone of him on the second track, which is fine. And I I, uh, I learned a lot by going through that process because it forced me to go, What exactly are you doing? And then. I started to deconstruct. For some folks that are going to listen to the soundtrack, they're going to notice that it sounds different than a lot of the stuff that I've done from a mixing standpoint because it's your mixing. <laughs> like I, yes. I, I am trying to do extend from what you were doing, and I used a lot of the same tools. I used like the the same drum kits, and um, I used the same amps, so as close as I could get. Am I understanding this correctly? That you did all the sound design for Visceral yeah, Fest? I made every sound that went into that game, and not only that, but the game itself is, has a very strong character to it when you're doing a whole game like that and you are like the sole individual sound designer cohesion matters a lot more than anywhere else i would say like you know it let's just say you were working on some sort of you know i mean i hate to say this but like a generic military shooter a lot of the sound effects that you're gonna that are gonna end up in that game are gonna sort of just be like your usual foley stuff nothing nothing crazy nothing of really strong character but then you know once you get like a a cartoony, bright, colorful sci-fi game, all of a sudden, like, you need to be really careful about where you source your audio from to make sure that everything sits together. And if it doesn't, you need to try to sort of make things sit together, whether it be on like a, like on like a frequency level or just like the general character of the sounds, like the types, yeah. the, the character of like all the little clicks and swishes and bloops and all that stuff. Like you really want to avoid having the game almost feel like a soup of sound libraries. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of like, it's like the audio equivalent of uh, art direction. It is uh, some of that stuff, things that you just kind of know inherently, like you can hear it, you know that it sort of fits in the world or are these things that you actually could write down on paper? Like how much of this is just like knowing, having the reflex, do you think? Uh, it definitely starts off at the beginning as a reflex. Uh, you hear things and like certain characteristics, like let's just say you, you, you get a sample library and you're going through and you're, you're listening to all the stuff in there and then you could think, you would think that like, oh, I, I, like, I really like the character of this, that like that, you know, that sort of fits in. And you know, you, you, at that point of development, you sort of have a blank canvas, you can do whatever you want technically. So then you start putting things together, but then once you start, you know, assembling your palette, then that's when the limitations actually start coming in. It's very similar to how in old games have a color palette like a Quake, for example, or Doom, like those older generation games that ran on software rendering, uh, they had a strict 16-bit, uh, 256 color palette. Mm -hmm. And so when they would start working on those games, they didn't have a fully developed palette picked yet. So they would just start making art and textures and stuff and whatever colors they ended up using, uh, they just would throw in the palette. And then eventually it hits a point where you filled up the palette and yeah you need to start making concessions there. And then, you know, you need to start crunching down, refining your color palette. And I guess sound in a, in a, in a sense, I mean, obviously it's, it's less technically limited, right? Mm -hmm. Because you can do whatever the hell you want today. You can throw in whatever you want, nothing's stopping you. But from like an artistic perspective, um, yeah, it, it certainly does start to give you pause um, later, later on down the line. It's like, well, I want my robot servos to sort of sound like they belong in the game but i also don't want them to sound like all the other robot servos i did for the game right and then you you try yeah. to figure out like okay well what is the character what, what are the characteristics that i can change and that's when more experimentation starts coming in it's or rather a different kind of experimentation right yeah a guided one as opposed to just like a, a feeling around in, in the dark one i would say of like of all the sort of creative things i've done music is definitely the most challenging as far as knowing where you're going to end up 
from where you start. You know, right. like when, when you're doing when you're working in level design, you almost end up like almost like building linearly. Like you know, you put your floors up, you put your walls up, you see everything coming together, you start putting your details up, etc. You might switch things around, whatever, but you have the general idea. But like when you start working on a song, there's a lot of like feel what I call like it's like feeling around in the dark. Yeah, you yeah. know, you're sort of like trying to find maybe a sound that tickles you, and then either either you're doing that or you have a sound in your head already that you kind of want to go towards and then you have to figure out how to actually achieve that sound yeah, right. in a way that's satisfying and it's sort of it feels like feeling around in the dark sometimes a lot of people don't really have the vocabulary to talk about music and what they want out of a song i mean our entire language is based around our eyes anyways not our ears right <laughs> that's true. and and so it makes giving feedback sort of more challenging and you end up needing to give feedback in more of a uh, in more like a reference sense like oh can you make it sound like this song can you make it sound like this part of this song yeah. being a composer in general like a big part of that is people skills if you want to be a professional composer you need to be as good as you are making music as you are figuring out what you're supposed to make mm -hmm. like because a lot of times and no to no fault of their own people have a tough time communicating exactly what they want uh and sometimes also when you make something and maybe they don't trust you fully. And I'm just, by the way, I'm just talking about a, a made up scenario, like a made up person right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So like they don't trust you fully. Maybe they'll question your decisions. You'll be like, oh, change this part. I don't like this one specific part. And they'll like laser focus on tiny things that don't really matter in the end. And it's just right. their, their own um, picky taste that they don't realize maybe doesn't apply to everybody else. And so that's where right. trust in the composer comes into play, I think. Yeah. I think I think it's really good to, if you really respect the work that your composer does, is to trust them in their decision making. And if you say something to your composer, like, I don't like this part. And then, you know, if they, if they almost like try to explain to you why they did that, that's the first sign of, hey, this was done with intent. Right, right. Maybe keep it. And then if you don't like it again, then maybe your composer will work with you to change the thing that you don't like, because of course you're the one paying for it. It's your, you get, you should be happy with what you get. Right. But, you know, it is important to be able to trust your composer is what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. This takes me back to um, working with graphic designers, actually. I remember I've been in situations where graphic designers have uh, been bringing something to a superior and they, the, the superior knows that it's not what they were looking for. It's not what they imagined. It's not fulfilling something between what they're hoping. Like basically what they want is the graphic designer to read their mind, right? Yes. Um, which will never happen. But the, that superior also doesn't know how to explain it. And in, I think, 90% of cases, I, I would say the skill should be the uh, graphic designer's skill to ask the right questions, to basically go, okay, you're not happy. But since you don't have a framework to explain to me what you want, let me create the framework by asking a bunch of targeted questions. And I have had this happen uh, with working with clients for uh, making music as well. Um, yeah. And that's usually the first step is getting the, you know, asking the questions. They're gonna, there's gonna be a lot of nodding and you know, open <laughs> answers until you bring them the final product. Um, yeah. Uh, I found that there's like a nice medium of like, should you bring something that's fully done so you impress them? Or should you bring something that's half-baked? Are you overthinking something as a composer? You know, where's that nice point where you can go, hey, do you like this or not? So you're not trying to like, def basically if they say no, you don't get mad because you just spent 90 yeah, hours on yeah, a song. Yeah. In the past, before I was doing a composition and game dev stuff in general, I was like an audio engineer for like local metal bands. Yeah. Sometimes those bands, they want everything done right away. They want they want like a final mix down as soon as they leave leave the studio and you know, they're impatient, they don't understand the process. Or sometimes they're just very immature. Some bands will you can notice that they're they're in the habit of trying to squeeze a little bit more out. It's like, oh, can you make this a little cooler? Can you make this a little cooler? Can you make this a little cooler? So what I would do sometimes with those, when I would discover that or you know, feel out that they're those kinds, we would finish recording the track. And then they would go home and I would start putting everything together and I would, I would create the final mix. And then I would just turn off the master limiter. And then they're like, oh, this is sick. Do you think you can make it like a little fatter? And I'll be like, hmm, okay, I'll see yeah, what I'll I can do. <laughs> yeah, I'll try my best. And I turn the master limiter back on and I send it to them. I'm like, oh yeah, this is perfect. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's so good. People tell stories about not changing anything and sending it back, and then people oh, are just yeah. like, oh, it's sick now. I don't like now. to do that. Yeah, I don't okay. like to do that because you can get caught. Right, okay. right. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. You you technically do change something, but yeah, they don't like they don't know. Uh, man, I can't. I don't even do imagine. that anymore, by the way. Yeah, well, if now you're listening. Your secrets out. I haven't now, done so that can't. to you. I don't do that anymore. It's been years. Uh, that's so funny. I mean, the world of uh, working with bands is something I'm not super familiar with, and I, I'm sure that it's a totally different set of people skills and expectations and timelines oh, yeah. are way different. I'll, I'll say this: there's a reason I don't do it anymore. All audio manip- or all audio engineering is just basically manipulating volume. I mean, that's all you're doing. I mean, if you're looking at <laughs> exactly. If you're looking at EQ, that's just like multi-band volume, right? And if you right. look at if you look at compression, that's just volume over time, right? <laughs> and you know everything is just adjusting volumes. Yeah, just, exactly. Just... So like, what do you do for a job? I'm like, I change volumes of stuff. Yeah, I just like turn all day long for like 12 hours a day. Sometimes I turn the volume totally off in some parts, but not everything, just parts of it. Do you want to turn volume up and down with me? Yeah. Do you want me to teach you? <laughs> why i turned up this volume yeah exactly yeah. so we've created fancier terms for it so it doesn't sound so boring but that's all we did yeah. it almost makes it sound like it's not incredibly frustrating at the beginning <laughs> when you're learning yeah. you know yeah but you're like you get started on it for the first time and you're like i'm just turning volumes up and down how damn hard can this be <laughs> why does my yep. music sound bad because you oh, you're turning up the wrong volumes and exactly. turning down the wrong. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. The art of knowing which volume to turn up and when. That's what we yep. get paid to do. I am going to be collaborating with a uh, very well-known composer pretty soon on a game, and uh, that will likely be announced sometime soon, and I'm very excited for that because I've been listening to their music since I was a kid, mm. and I finally get to make music with them, and that's a total trip. Uh, keep an eye out for that. You can't say who it is, right? I can't say who it is, no. And you don't know when. It's... Uh... We're I don't just, know when it's getting announced. Okay, everybody, subscribe. To everybody something. subscribe to 3D Realms. 3D Realms Twitter. If you want to find out, okay, <laughs> or, cool. and my Twitter because I will talk about it a lot. It was a it was a pleasure having you uh, in this chat with me, and I did I learned a ton trying to be you for six months, and I think people are gonna like Viscera Fest, and if they haven't heard uh, the Chapter One OST, they should definitely go check it out because you did some absolutely fantastic work. I am going to go and make sure I'm subscribed to everything, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you're gonna be doing next. All right, thank you so much, man, and thank you for the interview. This was fun. Yeah, of course, dude. All right, we'll take it easy.